Yeah. <laughs> You're listening to Autodesk's Digital Builder Podcast, a show that inspires construction professionals to innovate and use technology to improve how they build our world. I'm Eric Thomas, and I've been working in construction for nearly a decade. And now I have the privilege to sit down with industry trailblazers to hear how they're solving construction's biggest challenges and redefining the future of the built environment. Welcome back to another episode of Autodesk's Digital Builder Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Thomas. We are in downtown San Francisco at Autodesk's One Market office right now. I am joined by John Marks, the Chief Technology Officer from Swinnerton. How are you doing, John? I'm doing great today, Eric. It's a pleasure to be here on Digital Builder. It's also a pleasure to be back here at One Market. This was one of my first jobs in the construction industry as a young project engineer. Really? Well, it's fun to see that come back full circle. And uh, I appreciate your work on this building. It's such a cool space. And it's, it's been interesting to see how Autodesk's use of, you know, the parts that we have has evolved over time. So uh, happy to be here. And the last time that we met, we had a really good conversation that tied to topics with technology and construction, sustainability, delivery methods. Uh, we, we could have recorded that discussion and used it as a podcast on its own merit. But I wanted to come back to the core theme that you kept mentioning, and that's tied to people. And so with that in mind, could you share your thoughts about how leaders can ensure that are really truly putting their people first, especially when you're thinking about implementing technology or process changes that might impact their teams? Well, I'm a big fan of the um, human-centered design processes, human-centric design it's, um, I'll put in a plug here for the Luma Institute. It's where I um, got my training around human-centered design. Um, and it's when you put people first with your technology, and more than your technology, but um, that you really can't go wrong in your implementation. You can make mistakes along the way, but you will ultimately hit your goals. Um, I'd also say it's really important to listen well. And that's listen, observe, have a deep sense of empathy for your customers that you're trying to serve with technology, whether it's internal or external. And ultimately, communicate, communicate, communicate. You, you may feel like you're over communicating, but you can never do it enough. You have to have um, an open door policy um, and you have to leave those lines of communications constantly open. It's, it's such an important nuance, too, and it's easy to get excited about new technology. And there's so many things coming out in the construction industry specifically. I remember I was at a conference a, a number of years ago, and I was talking about exactly what you just shared as far as making sure people have a voice in that process. And somebody responded to what I had said in that moment and was like, it's not a democratic process. And we kind of went back and forth. And the way I tried to clarify that to him is it's not necessarily giving every single person a vote on the final technology thing, but exactly what you said, it's the conversation because you're learning what they're dealing with. They're learning why you're implementing things. And everybody feels a whole lot better about that process, both in meeting their needs and then also at the end of the day, you know, making them feel that they understand why instead of surprise, here's a new thing that changes how you do your job. It's, there's a lot of nuance involved in it. And with all of that in mind, everybody touches these new workflows. Everybody touches new technology in their career. How do you ensure that everybody has those opportunities to learn about that new technology or learn about these new processes so they don't feel so surprised or caught off guard when you do make changes or bring in new technology? It's a great question and a really big challenge, um, particularly for our industry, um, you know, construction teams, they'll be over their heads for 18 to 36 months. And they don't have time or bandwidth to absorb change during that period of time. So you really have these limited opportunities that you can effectively deliver change to project teams. Um, and that's typically when they're either in a downtimes in their construction schedule or they're between jobs. Well, if you scale that across an organization, you can't teach an entire organization a thing at one time. You actually have to run that change management process over the course of 18 to 36 months 
to ensure that your entire employee base can absorb change. So it's a particularly tough job for, for the construction industry to, to deliver that change. The other thing I would say is that um, often it is the project teams out in the field that are teaching us about technology and getting out into the field on a regular basis, walking the job sites, having conversations with superintendents and foremen and project engineers and project managers is the most effective way to learn about really what's next in the marketplace, what's what's coming, where the opportunities and challenges lie. So that that level of engagement, which is not easy to get people out of their chairs and out into the job sites, but it's it's important to be intentional about that. It all makes sense. And I I remember so well. So, of course, I spent so many years doing proposal management and and working in, you know, some change management stuff at a number of GCs. And if I think about your example in the context of writing technical sections for new proposals, of course, we're working with the proposed project team to make sure the technical section aligns with their expectations and everything. And trying to even just balance, hey, can you give me two pages on how you're going to build this parking structure or this campus for a university on top of their day to day? It is really difficult. And so communicating not just I need you to do something for me, but I'm here to you know, implement some level of change at your organization. There's a lot of, there's a human element and a lot of people skills that go into that to do that well and having empathy of where's your bandwidth? How can we meet you in the middle? And there's so many ways we can change how we you know, train and bring everybody together. I don't think it's, you know, everybody's in a trailer for eight hours with an instructor up in front saying, here's all the processes and everything. You've got to meet people where they're at. And so, especially in the last few years, I feel like that's, it's pivoting. It's it's changing now, and, and conversations like these ones, I think, have have an impact on those conver- uh, those nuances too. So, it's a bunch of fun. Yeah, I would say that the um, probably the most effective way that I've seen in recent years of delivering changes is is in bite sizes, is in that three minute video or that one page how to you know keep it small, keep it short, deliver it um, so people can consume it in five minutes or less. Yeah, and it's easier to go back to that too because you go, I only need to worry about this thing or I can't remember how this one small aspect goes because I only do it once every three months. Yeah. And not to have to parse through an eight-hour training video, you can pop in and if your training stuff is set up well, you snag that snippet, you go, this is how I use this aspect of this tech or this tool or software and then away you go. So w- Thinking about upskilling workers, I know is top of mind for most people, especially within the realm of technology and construction. How can companies really empower their people to go even further learning about advanced technology that might be outside of the scope of what the company is doing? So if there's something new, how do you, how do you facilitate that curiosity and give them the realm to, to try new stuff, even if it's not deployed across your company? Usually the curiosity is already there. And, and it's really about giving people room to be curious and permission to be curious. So that that involves being and managers being intentional about providing their employees um, the time to do it. Um, whether that is, you know, one Friday a month that an employee gets to choose how they work and what they learn, um, or having group um knowledge sessions to bring a team together for the sole purpose of learning something new, but then also to, to send the right signals. If managers themselves are not demonstrating their own curiosity and sharing what they're learning and, you know, sending the signal that it's okay to spend your time learning something new, chasing a passion, um, then people won't do it. I mean, ultimately, employees will follow the lead of their managers. So. It's important to do that. I think it's also important that organizations pivot from training to um, skills development. You know, training is this event that happens. Skills development happens every day. It happens in your experiences. It happens in those bite-sized um, uh, knowledge transfers I mentioned earlier. It happens with uh, your experience, with your mentors, with your coaches. Um, but rec- organizations that recognize all of that counts, all of that is um, valuable and leading towards the development of their employees will have a much um, easier way, easier path to upskilling their, work- their workforce. And that comes right back to what you started talking about today. 
in communication because you're you're communicating that it's okay to be curious and interested in this or you're communicating that if you want to try these things we're going to create some space for you to do that i don't know if if organizations have always been that way i feel like we're starting to to implement more of those changes the way we work is different and of course in construction every we're building stuff. So people still need to be on site. People are, are going to be going there. But finding ways to offer more flexibility, I think, empowers people to make and look for those opportunities. And that, em- that empowers your organization, too. There's a lot of retention there. There's just enthusiasm about the organization that they work for versus the these are the eight hours or 10 hours you have to be on site and this is what you're allowed to do. And if you step outside of that, you put yourself at risk and nobody wants that. So. Yeah, and our our industry struggles with uh, flexibility, shall we say, for good reason. Um, It's uh, a dangerous industry we're in, and it's important to follow um, certain methodologies in order for everyone to stay safe. And that that conservative um, behavior is embedded for good reason in the culture of construction. So to um, find that flexibility in your culture is a challenge for some companies, but I, like you, I observe that a lot of, um, a lot of companies are changing. Yeah, we, we've kind of been forced into it in some ways in the last few years. We've been forced to re- reevaluate how we approach work. And of course, my example, like I, I refer to technology that supports the construction industry. So where I work and how I work is going to be a lot more flexible than somebody that's out building. But I think there's a lot to learn from that because you can still be productive, you can still be focused, and you can bring value to the organization and not lean back into the butts and seats is productivity on the project side. So finding that middle ground and talking to your employees, I think has a huge value. And like the morale within, you know, Autodesk, if I if I look at our own organization, has gone up tremendously from what I've been told and what we've been understanding in employee retention and surveys and everything, because It's a conversation about flexibility to understand what works instead of something that's a bit more prescriptive. And like you said, the safety element in construction is is so paramount that we have to be mindful of how we have those conversations. But there's still ones that are worth having at the beginning and the end of the day. Absolutely. And I believe that every position um, is unique in how that person in that position can be most effective and um, make the biggest contribution to their organization. And I think it's important for leaders to really focus on that, that um, uh, to align a work policy, um, work environment to that position, as opposed to making some broad cultural statement that we must be together. Um, And I would also say to leaders out there that if your culture breaks because people are um, have some more flexible work, you probably need to work on your culture because, um, yeah, putting butts in seats is is not necessarily the strongest cultural element. Yeah, and I've lived that. I, I remember having evening calls because I was working on big international projects and still being expected to be at my desk 40 hours a week, even though two days a week I was on the phone because this was eight, 10 years ago where Zoom, Zoom wasn't a thing yet. So it was all the, the horrible conference line with the, the music that played forever, the 30 second clip. And we just didn't have the flexibility to take those three or four hour calls and offset how we spent our time in the office. And that was very frustrating. And I know a lot of people were upset about it. It's, it's a, a understandable reason to listen to people when they have those frustrations and, and create a space where it's okay to have those conversations instead of responding with punishment or, you know, something else a bit inappropriate. But that kind of leads into my next question. And everybody talks about the labor challenges in construction. And sometimes I think people tire of it, but it's an ongoing issue and it's going to be even more so as more retire and leave the industry or look for other opportunities if they do feel burned out. And so I'm Curious to hear what your thoughts are on how we can be more effective in addressing this shor- uh, labor shortage in construction. Like, what are what are the, some of the things that we can do to either enact change that either retains talent at companies or alternatively brings new people into the industry that haven't worked in it before? Well, we um, we talked about the the flexibility, and I think it is important for leaders to embrace that flexibility to find the best people for your organization because they can be anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world, and to uh, walk away from the value that someone can bring to your company because you can't 
put them in your office is um, can be uh, a mistake for for leaders out there. And that's a conversation people were not having five years ago for the most part. So it's encouraging to hear you say that. Yeah. And I mean, it, uh, a lot has opened people's eyes and um, people had to get really creative over the past few years. And that just brought a lot of um, productivity tools and um, gave people the work environments where they could be their best professional selves. The other thing I've seen in our industry is um, community engagement um, is really important to bring new people into the industry and to create diversity inside of an organization. Um, and I'll, just as an aside, I believe the most effective organizations are those organizations that make diversity a priority in their talent. Different perspectives sitting around a table will lead to the best decisions. Um, so it, it is critical for companies to have that community engagement and make sure that their organizations reflect the communities they work in. But a lot of construction industries, companies, put community engagement with their business development team and to ensure that they are able to meet the uh, MBE, WBE requirements for projects. I believe those programs should be in their ESG programs, that those should not be business development activities, but should be pure community engagement. People know when you are honestly approaching them um, to have a conversation, to share your knowledge and experiences and invite them into your industry. If you're doing it just to chase work, people see through that and it can have an, have the, a negative effect on your um, uh, diversity goals. So I think it's important to be, to be honest um, when you approach the community to do it with a, you know, an open heart and uh, good intentions and not just uh, chasing, chasing more business. I, I love how you frame that because I work for an organization that was one of, a, a federal contractor that was mostly doing like small disadvantaged businesses. And a lot of the stuff, the work they were getting was to fill those requirements that you're just alluding to right there. And later when working for larger organizations that didn't fit that mold, trying to fill those gaps just because of the contractual requirements was really difficult. And I remember especially working in more or rather less diverse parts of the country where we were bidding on projects in the Midwest where there might not be as many of these types of organizations. It was really difficult. And at the time, I was very junior in my career. And so just kind of listening passively to those conversations. But what you, you're saying right now really resonates with me if I look retrospectively at that, because you're building those relationships for the sake of building those relationships. And it's going to be easier to bring people into the fold because you're authentically trying to do that, not again, simply because, well, the federal government says I have to allocate 10% of my project staffing or material sourcing or whatever to this type of business. And that's a very different conversation to have with somebody. And of course, those businesses, some of them exist because they know they can take advantage of that. And that's all okay. Like, please continue doing that. We, we want people to have those opportunities. But I think the framing that you're, ma you're making right now, that has a really big impact. I, I like that. I, I hadn't thought about it in that, in that fashion I, I mean, before. this, this is an incredible industry to be part of. Um, I've been proud to be in this industry for 30 years. I can't imagine myself working anything else or anywhere else. And so for me to share that experience with others, honestly, is a mentoring relationship, which can help someone develop their own business, their own career, which can then return rewards to your own um, personal satisfaction, but also your company and your career as well. But that all started with, you know, again, that, that passion for sharing your experience, not a need to check a box on a federal form, right? That, that, that's, that's the difference. And you'll, you'll reap much, uh, much bigger rewards that way. And I just, I love the fact that I get to have conversations like this all the time because people in construction are passionate about this industry. It's such an important one. It's so neat. Like, Look at the space we're sitting in right now. Like this is a really cool environment to be, you know, hanging out in and having this conversation. But construction touches everybody. And not everyone thinks about it in that way. You know, but if you think about it, we have to have our houses, we have to have our spaces, we have places to work, hospitals, everything else. And just having chances to share that enthusiasm with others is is a ton of fun. Which kind of tails uh, into the next question I had for you. Is there anything else that comes to mind when you think about 
making your yourself is an attractive employer to potential staffing? Like, is there anything else that is really key to, to implement to, to look good while we're trying to chase these talented uh, labor when the competition is admittedly very fierce? I would say one of the most important things we can do, which we don't do a very good job of it, um, and I think the culture of our industry is such is we don't toot our own horn very well. Um, but to share with people really the why it's so much fun to be in this industry. I mean, there's a sense of camaraderie on job sites. The team, there's nothing more rewarding than working with a high performing team. And you get those opportunities in construction all the time because of the construction environment with the um, every day working to achieve a goal. It's incredibly rewarding to walk the streets of your town or a city you've worked in and to be able to point at a building and say, I built that. I I, love that. And we don't share that experience with people. But when I do work with young people in the industry today, and particularly craft workers, I mean, they have a ton of fun in their jobs and they work hard. They play hard afterwards. They form lifelong friendships in the uh, trenches of construction. Um, It's what I did when I was a union laborer. I think um, if we can share those stories, we wouldn't have the um, uh, labor shortages that we're we're talking about today because it's you can you can build a. a, a solid middle class lifestyle and have a very rewarding career in this industry. And um, you just have to reach out and grab that bottom rung and that ladder will take you all the way as far as you want to go. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I remember the first time I got to walk a project site after being part of the proposal process where we'd won, we'd seen the plans and, you know, we write out our technical section and everything's there. And then you know, six months later, 12 months later, getting a chance to do a site walk and walking around that facility that was just, you know, fiction at that point. We're all talking about it. We have the plans. We're looking at it. And it was such a cool experience. And I think that's just one extra step further for those that are on site doing the building. Like, I'll be honest, like I'm, I'm a tourist when I'm on a project site. I would never pretend like I have the skill set of a project manager or something else. But the the core foundation of of what's being done just has always really resonated with me. It's 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 fun. And I, I'm hopeful that we can continue chipping away at that perception problem that that we do have in the industry and bring more people in and understanding the conversation that we're having right now. Like it's, there's neat stuff. There's cool technology. It's, it's fun. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of room to grow. It's okay to brag about our industry. I, I try to do it more often. Agreed. And it's one of the reasons why I'm thankful that we get to, you know, do all of this stuff. Um, so I, I want to pivot our conversation and I think people are still a core part of everything else I'd like to ask you about today. But the other part of what we talked about when we first met was tied to sustainability and some materials advancements and such. And so just to kind of set a baseline today, could you share some more of the accessible ways that contractors and owners can really start thinking about sustainability in their projects? I feel like there's low hanging fruit that not every money might be thinking about just to get started in a more meaningful way down that path. First, I think um, construction companies, general contractors and uh, specifically, but also um, architectural firms really should not underestimate the impact that they can have in sustainability. Um, I've talked to a lot of leaders who believe that their ability to influence um, the sustainability of our industry is severely limited, but I don't think that's really the case. I think by having conversations with our clients, with our subcontractors, with our design partners, engineers, just having those conversations um, can have an outsized influence. Um, General contractors and architects, they sit at the nexus of the industry and they can have an outsized influence on the decisions that everyone else in that industry um, can make. So I think that that lowest taking fruit is to not be afraid to talk about it, not be afraid to ask questions, um, not be afraid to offer um, options and opportunities to our clients. Because, and I would say the other uh, low-hanging fruit is, um, is in the design phase. That is where sustainability starts, particularly um, when you're able to talk to owners who are um, going to be holding on to their 
um, assets for the long term for multiple decades. And they're concerned not just about the cost of building, which is a small percentage um, as compared to the total cost of operation of that facility. And uh, sustainable decisions can actually have a positive impact on um, those uh, costs by lowering those costs over the the course of um, the building life cycle. Um, So that's really where I think that low-hanging fruit is. For every company, culture is another place that you can, it's a relatively easy lever to pull and that you just sending the right signals, doing small things like eliminating single use plastics from the construction project. Those may have a limited impact in the big, big picture, but they send the right signals. They shift the culture. And then all the individuals in your organization start making decisions that lean towards sustainability. That has a real impact. So I would say, yeah, send those cultural signals, make sustainability um, a a part of your value system of your organization, and then just watch the magic happen. I love that nuance because, as you said, in the grand scope of something that the smaller, like not using re- reusable plastic or something, isn't isn't tremendous as the the carbon footprint of a building, for example, but you start making people understand who might not have had those conversations, like why we're doing this and that that it does have value. And I I love that is it trickles into how we build and how we start having those discussions. And I'm hearing more and more contractors who are having deeper and more meaningful conversations with their owners and their customers and clients too, because as we build those relationships and have those conversations, and I think there's a bit of a reset in how we approach our building methodology that's happening right now too, you start to learn from one another. The contractors have so much knowledge that they can really ask, like, tell me what your your goals and your expectations are. And you get to step back and go, well, what about this? Have you heard about this thing here? Or this might save you time in the schedule, or this might make your facility have a bit more leaning towards, you know, green or lead facility rating or something that they might not have thought about. And it's not because they're not interested, but they might not have that knowledge. And so you get to kind of educate upward especially when you're working with somebody who's a serial builder and you have, yeah. you know, okay, we're going to do 40 projects for you and they're going to be all very similar, but let's set our baseline and expectations at the front. And that, that down chain conversation, it has a huge impact. Yeah, it, it really does. So where, where are you starting to see some more exciting innovations or advancements within the realm of materials and supply chain? I know everybody's thinking about that right now. It's, it's been hard to get things. It's hard to be predictable in where we're getting things. Like what, what, what's interesting right now that, that you'd love to share with me? Um, well, material, in the world of materials, what's really going to make a significant difference and move the needle um, uh, in our industry and for the planet is going to be in um, steel and concrete. Those are just incredibly carbon intensive. And there are some products coming to market that significantly reduce the carbon impact of those materials. So I would say in the next three to five years, we're going to really see the needle move um, uh, in the built environment because of those two materials um, reducing their carbon footprint. What we have uh, uh, on the market today that I'm excited about is the mass timber um, uh, systems. And they, they have a, a dual benefit is not only are they a lower carbon footprint in their um, production, but they also sequester carbon so that you are actually sequestering carbon. If you build a building for the long term, you could be sequestering carbon for hundreds of years. And um, that, that does help. And I'm starting to see more and more in the media mass timber being a real thing. And I was hoping you could tell me a little bit more about how you're actually implementing that at Swinerton. Like, uh, give me a little bit more nuance about the projects and, and how that's kind of shown up on the project sites. Yeah, it, it's it's actually an interesting story because it's um, impactful to our business, Swinerton, but the industry as a whole in a few different ways. Um, for those not familiar with the mass timber um, uh, systems. They're, they're really a structural system. There's two basic components. There's glue lamb beams and columns, which have been around forever, and you see them often in residential treatments, but um, they've been in the commercial market for a long time. And then there's uh, CLT. 
and which uh, is really just incredibly thick plywood. So um, it's eight to 16 inch thick pieces of plywood. And, um, you know, columns and beams obviously is a structural system. Um, the CLT panels are what would replace uh, concrete um, floors. Uh, so, and also, you know, steel uh, framed floors. The, um, it's incredibly popular right now. Architects love mass timber. Um, you walk around a mass timber facility, you see all that beautiful expo exposed wood, the exposed uh, ceilings of the CLT panels, those glue lamp columns and beams. You can um, uh, create uh, shapes with those systems that you can't do with concrete and steel. So it, it's a designer's um, dream, the, the mass timber products. The other thing has to do with um, productivity. To erect a mass timber uh, structure takes five people, right? You've got a crane operator, you've got the, the picker um, loading the, uh, the crane, you've got um, a couple guys on the um, building itself that are unloading and assembling the components. Everything is, all the connections are prefabricated. They just slide in together. So there's no custom work in the field. It's really just locking these pieces of systems in place as if they were um, uh, Lincoln Logs. So it creates a lot of productivity gains in the field. So that's obviously great for schedules, um, great for owners, great for contractors. It also gives um, Swinerton, uh, the opportunity to really own more of the supply chain that we um, actually are fabricating our own connectors that we we have our own facility for um, doing the uh, fabrication of the glue lamb columns and beams so that we can actually ensure the quality of the product before it ever gets to the field um, we're able to drive and um, increase profit Profitability as a result, lower costs for our clients. Often these structures are price competitive with concrete and steel. Um, so, I mean, it's just a, it's a very exciting product and creates a lot of opportunity for contractors to be more than just the general contractor, but to be a true builder on site. It's neat seeing all of this come together. In the prefabrication conversation, I think is starting to get more and more meaningful in recent years especially as, as you alluded to, the, the scope and the capability of those materials that we're using has started to change now. So letting people understand prefab isn't just a boring gray box that you stand up and you go, we built this cheaply elsewhere and stood it up. You can build these incredibly beautiful structures that a lot of people, I think, might not have full scope and understanding of. So I appreciate you sharing the context there. And it's also been kind of neat to see so many new, more contractors bringing more self-performed work into the conversation too, because you're not just, okay, we're the executive management team, but we're bringing all the subs. The, the, the in-house conversation changes when you do have the people on staff and you build this talent and you build this pool. And then those people also recognize and see, okay, like, we've been invested in as people to build these skill sets. And even though our project has ended here, I can be confident that I'm going to be brought to a new project down the line and not just saying, okay, project's done, you know, head off home. So there's, there's so many layered benefits to adopting some of these methodologies and finding innovative ways to bring and, and meet some of our material challenges right now. It's, it's a fun moment. Um, and just like you said, get kind of nerdy and looking around and going, gosh, this is cool. We can design all this stuff that you might not have been able to do with concrete or you can do in a, a scope and scale that you just simply might have not have been able to do. Yeah. You mentioned uh, self-perform work. It's one of the most exciting things about Swinerton right now over the past uh, five years is um, for most of my career at Swinerton, we had a very small number of craft employees. But today we have as many or more craft employees than we do administrative employees. So we are performing a lot more of our work. That, that ensures that we can control quality, we can control safety on the job site, we have a lot more control over cost and schedule. It really allows us to, um, and I'll quote my CEO, Eric Foster here, is to control our own destiny on the project site. Um, that we can deliver what the client expects um, when they expect it with a lot more surety. The, um, 
And, and that leads to opportunities for a lot more um, control uh, of the project delivery um, mechanisms that we can now control more of the supply chain, buy more of our materials, ensure the quality of those materials, the timeliness of the delivery, all of this. And a lot of this is enabled today by technology. Um, in the past, particularly when I started with the industry, most general contractors were just risk managers. All, you know, we were just distributing risk across the uh, architect and the uh, engineers and all the subcontractors and then making sure everyone did their job. And our, our really best tool was to hit people over the head with their contracts. Say, you said you would do this, you will do this. Um, not a really effective or collaborative way to deliver high quality, safe, low cost and timely um, uh, product. Right. It's hard. You know, it, I mean, everybody needs to protect themselves yeah. to some degree. And if the contract vehicle is structured this way, it's understandable to have that slightly adversarial relationship. Yeah. But, but today it's changing. Yeah. Today, technology allows us to manage the complexity of the construction project such that we can take on the risk of doing the work ourselves, of purchasing the material, of even doing our own engineering and uh, construction documents, right? This technology allows us to take on this risk ourselves. And that gives us, a, again, a lot more opportunity for not only improving our own margins, but improving um, how we deliver for our clients. I think there's so much there. And in, in addition to being kind of a, a risk management role too, Construction companies are becoming technology companies. There are so many different tools and technologies and processes to deploy in the industry that if you don't think about it and with that lens, it's it's going to be challenging to stay competitive. It's going to be challenging to bring the talent in. If if somebody, especially a young person who is used to using technology and having all of these interesting things in their personal life, gets to work and either they're handed an iPad and a drone and said, let's go build and do this cool stuff, or you know they have a roll of blueprints and two weeks later they change and they miss that. So they built something and I got to rip it all wild. Like that's a nightmare, obviously, and a generation of a lot of the, the waste that comes out of construction. And so embracing these changes in, in new methodologies, I think it's, it's really created an exciting moment with construction, which does lead into my last question I've got for you within this realm before we can jump into a couple of fun ones. But I have the chief technology officer sitting in front of me right now from Swinerton. So I can't help but ask one more tech focused question. Is there any technology advancements or innovations going on right now that you're particularly excited about or find particularly interesting? Something I've been excited about and actually for, for a few years now, and um, I'm uh, hoping that it comes to fr fruition in the marketplace is um, automated building operations. Um, and that leads back to my passion for sustainability. There is a ton of waste in the operations of the built environment and particularly uh, buildings inhabited by humans. There's just a ton of uh, wasted energy, um, wasted water, wasted space. And uh, I believe that with the advent of um, machine learning algorithms being applied to holistic building systems that not only can the built environment be a lot more comfortable for the people um, living in those environments and working in those environments, but the cost of those of the built environment over its lifespan can be significantly reduced and its impact on the planet can be significantly reduced as well. So as the, uh, one day I hope to walk into a building and as the sun comes up into the windows, the shades are automatically closing as the ambient temperature outside is raising, that the HVA systems are uh, reducing um, in real time, that as the, uh, the compressor in the basement is starting to shake a little bit, that the um, service company is called to come out and fix it before it breaks, that that the building intelligently will start to take care of itself in a way that humans just can't manage that complexity to, to do well. So that's something I'm very excited about. It's just a personal passion of mine, this, this dream of the, the, um, automated, uh, the automated building. Yeah. I, I'm furiously nodding my head right now because 
it's it's something I just find very neat on a personal level. So I, I was telling somebody earlier today, actually, I have a, a, a small smart speaker in every room of my house. A lot of my devices in my home are automated. So I have smart light bulbs. I, 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 I don't touch a light switch in my house. I announced to my friend Google, hey, I want to do a thing and lights turn off. I have automated things. And that's just the, the tip of the iceberg as far as what you were alluding to. And I see that in the future myself. And I'm very excited about it because it... It's just comfortable, even outside from the the sustainability aspect. That is also very important as far as you know managing the HVAC systems and all of these other aspects. That if you're not home, your house is still, for lack of a better descriptor, living and breathing. It's just really neat. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is, and I believe that our buildings can learn from us um, over time, just as your home is probably learning from you and how to best uh, react to your desires of how to to live in that space. I believe buildings can do that for for all of us who are operating in there together, and yeah, have uh, um, again not not only do well for the environment and for the bottom line, but do well for us as humans. Yeah, agreed. I mean, even my uh, my Google assistant will ask me, like, you you tend to turn on this light at this time. Would you like to turn it on or off or whatever? It's, learning. it's, it's starting to learn. Which, yeah. in some aspects, is a, a little weird. It's you're starting to get used to it, but I think we're we're building the, the infrastructure to make that all make sense and kind of come together. Yeah. Um, and I'm just enjoying being you know on the outside of the edge of that, at least within what's feasible for my my own home at this time right now. It's fun. So I have one more question for you that I ask everybody, and it's a really interesting recurring one tied to tools and the way you work on different projects. So what is one tool that you would bring to any project you work on, no matter what that project happens to be? It might sound a a little cheesy, but mindfulness is the most important thing to bring to any any project uh, or any relationship. It is being present. It is being vulnerable. It's being empathetic. It's really being there and observing your environment, the people around you closely and carefully. That, that's the most important thing. But, but I will sh- throw in the bonus because in the physical world, every project I go to, I carry a carpenter's pellet, pencil and a tape measure because you never know when you have to uh, check a d- d- dimension. Absolutely. The tape measure one comes up pretty regularly. I I was talking about that with somebody yesterday. I think I have four in my house or something. It's it's always good to have one handy. But your your mindfulness answer, I think it really just wraps back up into some of the ethos that I'm just getting from you as we had this conversation and comes back to that people conversation. And I'm I'm hopeful that more of our leaders have that that mentality as they step into either new leadership roles they might not have had or start to learn and and think about how they they listen and understand in their environment because I think it it has impacts on your own relationships but also on the business and then even if we think very firmly in the business realm employee retention and all the staffing stuff that we all think about and talk about but don't necessarily have the right words to to kind of describe how we're trying to bring those things back together so I, I love that answer that's great right so the final one today, is there anything you're working on or uh, are involved in right now that you love the opportunity to plug or share a little bit about today? The thing I'm personally working on, and Swinnerton is working on as a whole as well, is, uh, is the cu- culture of coaching. Um, and uh, it makes a really big difference in an organization and how people are satisfied with their work and being um, taking the time to be a coach to the next generation of leaders, or you can even be a coach to the person sitting next to you for um, something that they want to learn and you already know. It is, um, I think it's making a big difference in the retention at Swinnerton. It's making a a big difference in the um, quality of work life for the employees in uh, in my departments. Um, And yeah, I think that's I was to um, plug that one thing, it would be it would be that be a be a good coach. Yeah, it, it's a big culture thing, and it, it yeah. all comes every all of this interconnects. And so I, I, I'm happy to hear that. And I think as we think about all the new technologies we have on site and processes and such, if if you don't have that set up where you have mentors and you have those relationships, it's difficult to deploy some of these things. So again, it's it's all yeah. interconnected. So that's uh, that's really encouraging to hear. But 
Aside from that, thank you so much for joining me today. And everybody out there listening, thanks for taking the time to listen to another episode of Autodesk Digital Builder Podcast. If you've got any questions or you want to suggest a future guest for an episode, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn or you can find me via builder underscore ditter, (laughs) builder underscore digital out on Twitter. And if you're enjoying the show, you can also watch us on YouTube. All of these are video podcasts now. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the different places. And if you could rate our show, I'd appreciate it if you took a moment to do that. Give us five stars or whatever you feel appropriate. It helps us out on the back end. But on that final note, goodbye.